Our text is the Old Testament reading from the book of Deuteronomy. And now, O Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? It will help us here if we recall once again the background to these verses. These are the words, are the farewell address of Moses to his people. They are encamped on the eastern bank of the Jordan River. Soon the signal will sound for them to go forward and cross over that river into the land of promise. Moses will not be going along with them, but he is preparing his people for the greatest campaign of their lives. And he does so by pointing them to their own past history. God is the one who set you free from the tyranny of the Egyptian Pharaoh, Moses told them. He is the one who rescued you once again on the shores of the Red Sea. He led you all through the wilderness in a pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night. When your food rations failed, he fed you with manna. When your canteens ran empty, he broke open the barren rock to refresh you. When your straggling column was attacked by the Bedouin hordes of Amalek, victory was secured by the uplifted arms of prayer. And when you threw it all away at Mount Sinai, when you worshipped the golden calf for the crying out loud, when you shattered your relationship to God in as many pieces as Moses broke the two stone tablets, then God forgave you. God gave you the chance to begin again, to pick up the broken pieces of your life, to carry on, to continue your homeward march as the fallen but forgiven sons and daughters of God. And now, O oh Israel, Moses is asking, and now what does the Lord thy God require of thee? On the basis of everything that God has done for you, the goodness and the kindnesses that you have received in your life, what shall be your response? Moses does not treat the people like religious robots, Dumb dogs who you've got to lead around on a leash. Mere victims of circumstances or pawns in the game of life. You have a part to play. Moses appeals to their memory. He compels them to think, to decide, to act for themselves. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? but to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in his ways and to love him and to serve him with all of thy heart and all of thy soul. That's what the Lord your God requires of you. To fear him. That means respect, reverence, and have a high regard for God in your life. So that you will take into consideration the way that God wants you to walk. And we, God requires that you love him. We Americans have a hard time with the word love. We think of it as a sentiment of warm feeling, an emotion of some kind. That's why we speak of falling in love and falling out of love as though it were a bathtub. In the Bible, the word love means a total commitment, a loyalty and an allegiance. The love of God for you and Jesus Christ certainly wasn't a sentimental, kissy face kind of thing, was it? It was a commitment to you so strong and so fierce and so tender. That love wouldn't let you go even though it meant the cross. That's why Moses is saying, 
All the Lord requires of you is to love him and to respect him. To keep his commandments and his statutes as it is as I command you this day. For your own good. We always think it's a terrible curse when we're asked to love somebody. We don't know that it is a free gift and it is a privilege. Look at the anxiety among our people. The fear. Not only of dying, but even of living. Anxiety is a sign of a broken tie, a disturbed relationship. And love is a restored relationship. That's why the person who loves and is loved can't self fear and anxiety. Safe, secure, what should I be afraid of? We get all kinds of counseling when we're in trouble. Self-help classes and advice columns of every imaginable sort. But who anymore tells us to love God? Yes, yes, we should communicate with each other and all that stuff. How will you and I ever walk side by side staring at each other? We'll fall in a ditch. We can walk together only as we face in the same direction and have our eyes on the same goal. And that goal is God. He is the one from whom you draw your strength and weakness. From whom you get your direction in this confusing world. From whom you derive a sense of personal worth in a dehumanizing society. It is from him and him alone that we have the courage to carry on when we have fallen and been defeated. Moses adds more. Behold the heavens. And the heaven of heaven is the Lord's, and the earth and all that in it is. But the Lord had a delight to choose your fathers and their seed after them. And you, as it is this day. Moses contrasts the creator of the cosmos, the highest of heaven, the earth and everything in it that you can name. Contrast that with the insignificant, the puny people of Israel. God chose your father, sheep herders. He chose their posterity after them. And God chose you. And if you want to know the reason why God ever chose you, it is a mystery hidden in the heart of God that I cannot explain. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. What good? Well, you know what circumcision was. It was the mark in every Jewish male that marked him as God's man. It was the sign that he was one of God's people. But what good is that external sign in the flesh? If the inner attitude is missing, what good is your marriage license, your wedding ring, if the commitment isn't there? What good is all of the externals of religion if you lost the kernel to it? What if I don't feel like loving God anymore? Then circumcise the foreskin of your heart for a change. Why don't you repent? Why don't you resign as the Lord of your own life? Why don't you say no to those rivals for first place of God in your life? If as you repent, you will find that you can love again. That's what Moses is saying. Circumcise your heart. He continues, For the Lord your God is is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, mighty and terrible, who is no respecter of persons, 
That means he's totally impartial. And he does not take bribes. You can't buy him off with a gift. Human words are lacking to describe the grandeur of God. He is absolutely unique, surpassing human comprehension. His works among men have been mighty and they are fearful. And he is also a God who is impartial. He is not impressed by any human rank or status or position or power. And you can't bribe him with a gift. How could you? What are you ever going to give God that he doesn't already have? Now that's something for us religious folks to remember. We think we can horse trade with God. Well, look, I didn't do this and I did do that. And that will balance it out even though my heart wasn't in it. You can't bribe God with the external acts. He is impartial. He, he calls you not only for the sunshine but also for the storm. The good days of your life as well as the bad. It's easy to love them when you're healthy, but what about when illness comes? Even Jesus, most severe critics, had to admit that he played no favor. He took time for the rich young ruler, as well as that nameless woman with a female disorder. He answered the theological questions of the Pharisees and also the chattering of the little children whom he took upon his lap. The twelve disciples forsook all to follow him. But two other people did he single out for highest praise. One was a Sidonian woman and the other was a Roman soldier. Both of them were foreigners. He stopped that funeral procession in far-off Nahum. Not because anyone asked him to. Not that anyone expected him to. But simply to raise up a widow's only son from the dead. You remember the gift of gold and frankincense which the wise men gave him. But Jesus honored just as highly the lunch of loaves and fishes which a little boy once gave him. And that's why Moses is saying, God executes justice for the orphan and the widow. He loves the stranger and gives him food and drink. Love ye therefore the stranger. You were once strangers in the land of Egypt. Sometimes I think all of Scripture is a sermon on how God takes the side of the weak and the defenseless. The orphan and the widow. The outcast and the downcast. And that's why God says, if you love me, you've got to love what I love. You were once strangers. How did it feel? Now, you and I are second, third, fourth generation born Americans. But it didn't have to be that way. And it surely was not that way for our forefathers who came to these shores. Can you remember going to a new school the first day? Taking up a place in a new job somewhere? Getting the cold shoulder from everybody else who knew what was going on, but you didn't even know what a lavatory was? You be kind to the stranger. For I'm kind to them. And you remember that you were once strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and cleave to him all thy days, Moses sums up. He uses the word cleave. That's the same word the Bible uses for the closest, most intimate relationship on earth. 
that of a man and his wife. It is narrow and exclusive and complete. It allows no rivals on the outside whatsoever. For he is thy praise and he is thy God that have done for thee these great and terrible things which thou hast seen with thine eyes. God is your praise. He's the reason for every bit of gratitude and thanksgiving you've ever known. And he is thy God whose hand has been behind every blessing and loving kindness you've ever received. Moses does not speak of nature here, nor does he sing of it. He doesn't describe it as a poet, nor does he analyze it as a scientist. Moses points you to God, whose good and guiding hand is behind all of the events of your life. And Moses closes it out with a strange promise. Your fathers once went down into Egypt, three score and ten persons. But now the Lord has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. It seemed impossible when Abraham, their father, journeyed alone, aged and childless. And when that little band of sheep herds went down into Egypt, 70 souls in number, that God would ever make much out of their little. Make a people out of a people who were no people at all. Bring strength out of their weakness. Well, the same can be said for your forefathers and for our American colonists, God has done the same thing for us. Who would have believed when Washington soldiers left bloody footprints in the snow at Valley Forge that history would ever have unfolded the way it has for us? Now the promises that God has kept in the past are a pledge to you. They are down payment. Of all the promises you still have to go on, strength for the day, rest for the laborer, light on the way, grace for your trial, help from above, unfailing sympathy, and undying love. Amen. Peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.